All right. Welcome, 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 my bows and bow ties. This is the Black Opinionated Woman, also known as a bow. If you're new to my channel, I'll talk about three things, Black women, Black culture, and anything related to middle age, such as shows, um, parenting, health, whatever it is. Okay, so I want to get right on into it. We are going to recap the Writer's Room podcast episode 10. Let me go ahead and put that title up. I meant to have that title up. Episode 10. Michael Patrick King yammers. He does more yammering. Now look, I tried to upload the thumbnail, but I was having difficulties. Okay. So this was the thumbnail for some reason that I could not get uploaded. You see that this is what you are supposed to select coming in here at the time of this live. Um, hopefully by the time I get done with this, I will be able to go ahead and upload this after the actual, um, live stream. All right. So this is what was supposed to get uploaded so that you can select it coming in. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm going to mute myself because my family is too loud. Okay. Now that I've finished yelling at my family, let's get right on into it. So Michael Patrick King, more yammering. Um, so Rushna returns for this. Um, this was the recapping of the last uh, episode of And Just Like That. And with Rushna Frukba, I cannot pronounce her name correctly. You guys have to excuse me. Um, let me just say this. I had to get up, take my son to go take his SATs. My daughter was supposed to have a basketball game um, that my husband took her to, which was canceled because we got a whole snow situation going on. There's supposed to be all these practices and everything else. I got other kids asking for play dates. And so I'm like, come on. But I got my comfy robe on because, well, that's what I do. It's like my security blanket. So what took me so long to get this out before I get right on into it? Um, this past week, I was really just busy lifing. Life was getting in the way. I was lifing hard this week. But ultimately, I really was not motivated to make this live um, for this particular episode because I'm pretty much done with it. Like, it was just like, it was just more of the same. And sure enough, when I actually listened to the podcast, it was more of the same. Michael Patrick King was Google. He knew everything. He knows all about women's issues and periods and raising children and everything. He can talk to women's issues more than women. And so with that being said, I felt like similarly with Samantha uh, Irby, uh, Rushna was not really all that vocal. Really, none of the women were all that vocal. Um, I mean, they were, but they weren't. It was like the Michael Patrick King show. So basically what I think he needs to do, he should just host his own show. He needs a show, not a scripted series. He needs a show. You know what he should do before I get into this? I think... He should actually um, voice narrate books. He needs to be on Audible because Michael Patrick King likes to talk and yammer. He has a good voice, okay? He needs to be doing thrillers or something. He needs his own show where he can just yammer all the way, yammer, 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 because he's Google and knows everything. But I think, Michael, Michael, I want you to listen to me. You have a career in narrating uh, thrillers and books and everything. So this is what I need you to do. I need you to contact Audible. You need to go ahead. Um, I think I know how to do it. I was supposed to um, take care of some other stuff for a book I wanted to have narrated. I never really got it done. But let me just tell you something. You should be on Audible because you love to hear yourself. You love it. about Even if it's something that's not even in your bailiwick. So I think you need to get on Audible and you need to get a contract and you need to go ahead and just do that thing. OK, so you can thank me and you can forward me my coins because you need to be on Audible. Let's take a look at this thumbnail again before I get right on into it. The thumbnail that didn't exist at the time of me recording this, but I will have to update it, um, upload it later. This is what it was all about. The Yammer, all the Yammerer, I should say. All right, got that off my chest. So let's get into this review. Number one, they said that normally, like when you're having like a, a the end of the season, like um, I guess um, end of the season, like that last episode is typically like a big finale. But they said this was not a big finale. But I kind of thought it was. It felt like a finale, and I don't have a problem with that. There's nothing wrong with having like a finale to your season. Anyway, so I apparently. 
called it when I actually narrated the show, the actual show at the time that it aired. Okay. I said, Lampgate. I did not know. Now I'm just going to go to my notes for a second. They were talking about um, when I guess Carrie, um, Sarah Jessica Parker was, I guess, doing the table read and they were talking about the lamp and they said it became like this small story. And I did not know that I was clairvoyant because I was like lamp gate. So they were basically talking about how they wanted to call out that maybe she thought that big was mad at her and they were looking for signs. She was looking for signs into his death. Right. And basically it was just kind of like to signify that like she hadn't quite let go, which is normal for anyone who has experienced death or loss. Okay. So with that being said, I don't have a problem with that. This all seems kind of sort of normal, right? When people start thinking like, is my so-and-so talking to me through the light or whatever it is. So he starts basically um, referencing like metaphysics and spirituality and heaven and that type of thing. All things that I think many people deal with when they experience um, any sort of uh, trauma, medical trauma, loss or something like that. So at this point in time, he's kind of sort of normal in a way. I was like, oh my goodness, but he's talking all the time. And I'm like, how is it that a man knows more about how women grieve? Do you know what it's like to be a widower? Not a widow, but a widower. Wait a minute. Did I say that right? Because anybody could be a widower. <laughs> but you know what I mean? A widow-ess. You don't know how to be a widow-ess. So anyway, so he's getting into it. And so this is what he does. He's basically um, talking about that whole situation during the actual airing of the episode where Miranda was challenging Carrie about her thoughts surrounding um, heaven and, and God. And so... Miranda, you know, Beanie Cap Satan was basically calling out to Carrie at the time, like, hey, it's just guilt that you're experiencing. And I remember when I was recapping that episode, I was like, she's so evil because my thing is you can't, unless they're harmful to themselves, I don't like how people want to police how anyone is grieving or self-soothing unless it's something extremely dangerous, like drinking yourself into a coma or something, right? So if she wants to believe in God, obviously I believe in God. I know, I know you guys have heard me talk about certain things before, but whether she believes in God or knocking two stones together, I don't know, whatever her thing is, I'm like, how do you question the way someone seeks comfort in a time of grieving? I told you, Miranda is beanie cap Satan. Beanie cap Satan. So anyway, getting back to Michael Patrick King and his yammering cell, because I'm telling you right now, he needs a contract with Audible since he loves to talk. He needs to be um, narrating um, audio books. Um, they talk about the lamp personification stuff, right? So it was just like a whole lot more talking and some yammering and talk, 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 talk. And he did call out the fact that he had a lamp that I guess he was dealing with. Um, apparently he lost his mother. Now, that anything, any sort of loss, like a parent, a loved one, a sibling, whatever, a best friend, these things can be, uh, of course, my computer wants to notify me that daylight savings time is tomorrow. So um, anyone who experienced some sort of loss is looking for comfort and answers and that type of thing. So he, he mentioned how, um, you know, he, he thought about the lamp and the light and I guess his experiences during that time. Um, he said that he saw a psychic um, and he thought that maybe his mother might have been speaking to him through electricity. Um, they contemplated like tossing that around during the actual airing of the episode, whether or not they wanted Carrie to see a psychic. I'm glad they didn't because it would have just been like another like cheeky kind of like <sighs> stereotypical thing. Like, let me go see a psychic whatever miss me so anyway um why did i write this down they made a comment about the writers are starting the finale with an end date so let me just pause right here to say when i was listening to this which was just yesterday because i really was just not in the mood to really recap this right because i was just like it's going to be more of the same with them talking um i think the thing like i said that struck me was because here we are in march right this is women's like history month or whatever um I think I'm just in this weird position. I'm not like a hardcore feminist. I'm a faux feminist. Like I'm not even a real one because I don't like all these waves of feminism, right? And yet and still, I'm very pro like letting women tell their stories and their experiences and sharing their thoughts. And so being that you have a show that was centered largely around women 
experiencing loss and dating and 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 evolution and all these things. And I'm even going to go as far as back to the sex. I can't get the words out to the Sex in the City um, series, the original series. You know, when this is centered around around women. Regardless of the problematic stuff, right? Because when we were watching it at the time, like we weren't thinking about all the problematic things that were going on. I'm like, it is what it is. I'm not trying to sit here and critique the previous um, series. I still love the series. I think the, why I was so reluctant to listen to this last one was because I'm like, I don't care what he has to say. I just want these women to, to narrate and tell these stories. Even if I agree or don't disagree. These are women's issues that we're dealing with. Not to say that there isn't overlap with men, but I kind of feel like I don't like when people, everyone wants to insert themselves in everyone's spaces, right? I'm like, let's just call a thing a thing. And I, I feel like with our current woke culture, we have to be so correct on everything. Sometimes we just got to call a thing a thing. You just got to call a thing a thing. So anyway, my my issue is he's inserting himself. He's yip yapping about stuff. And yes, I know there's like a significant portion of the LGQ, LGBQ, L, the alphabet group. Um, I know there's a large portion of them that watch the show. I, I would probably say more so the men, right? Um, but I don't believe at the time, and I could be wrong that this was for them per se, right? But anybody can watch it. Does that make sense? In my mind, that made sense. So for me, I kind of feel like, although there are portions that can probably touch every group, this was really meant for women and probably primarily white women, right? And so I don't know if, the reason why I don't want to critique the previous series and I'll get back on, on track is, uh, look, yes, it, it, it was whitewashed and all these other things, right? We can we can critique every possible everything of all these other shows, but nevertheless, there were stories that they were trying to tell. And so I don't like when people, everyone wants to inject themselves into all these spaces, which was why at the time when the whole Leah Thomas thing came out, I just kind of felt like enough. I'm like, so women can't even have sports where they can compete and be competitive, Right. You know, so like, why does Leah Thomas get to actually um, compete in men's sports and then decide, yeah, I want to compete in women's sports too? And then you have to be sensitive now because Leah, I guess I'm a woman now. That's that's the impression I got. Now it's like this person is a woman too, and now you have to accept. I'm like, no, no, I don't. I all the way do not. So anybody who's watching this, you are allowed to be mad and just go ahead and just click off because I'm probably going to say something that's triggering. So that's the reason why I was basically struggling with listening to this last episode of Michael Patrick King, who thinks he's Google and who should probably just go get a contract with Audible and narrate some books. He's got a great voice. I wish I could be like, oh, oh, oh. like I can't speak like him. All right. Let me get back on track. That's a talkable moment. Go ahead. If you want me to um, tell you what a talkable moment is, put it in the chat. Um, so look. <sighs> They mentioned that the coffee shop that these women are um, sitting in actually was rebuilt from the original Sex in the City because the original one was actually a fake. I did not know that. So that's good to know, blah, blah, blah. So he talks about, now we're still talking about the metaphysical, like um, the spiritual and heaven and all kind of stuff like that. So Charlotte brings up the whole heaven concept, right? And so what happens is during this conversation, you've got Miranda saying, what do you think? Big is up there and having smoking a cigarette or cigar or something like that. It's challenging, um, Carrie, but it's almost antagonistic, in my opinion. I'm like, wait a second. You don't get to challenge her beliefs on on where people go in death or whatever. And then you feel some kind of woman when people challenge you about how you're beanie cap Satan and you're like kicking Steve to the curb, right? So I kind of feel like, back up, sister. Whoa, Nelly. So Charlotte's version is, hey, do you think Big would never want you to kiss another man again? So she gives a different perspective. Um, but anyway, I just feel like Beanie Cap Satan is mean. And while Carrie is dealing with the grief process, and I guess Carrie in that moment, she basically is like, well, whatever's going to get me through. I forgot what I wrote down. But um, all I know is I wrote that Carrie sets, shuts her down. So let me just pause right here. The writers for this portion, like that, that scene, honestly, I felt like they did a good job. 
right? They basically were calling into like, well, what do I believe in times of grief, right? They're challenging you right there on the spot. Like, what is it that I believe? Can I change my beliefs? All these other things, which I didn't have a problem with that, which is the reason why whenever I think Rashna is part of the, the I'm assuming she was part of the writers. Um, she was one of the writers for this episode. If I remember correctly, I didn't really hate this episode. I think. Now I'm going to go back because I might have to eat crow. But I don't think I hated this episode. But Michael Patrick King, he's got a whole lot to say. <laughs> I'm like, Google himself. Oh, my gosh. He is a true narcissist. I want to know what it's like to live in his world. I want to know. You know, inquiring minds want to know. So, look. Now, Carrie shuts it down. So, Rushness says um, she understood um, I think she experienced the loss of a father or someone. I can't remember, but she said when she experienced loss or something along those lines, let me put my little ticker up because I can't remember the exact words. Everything is alleged or not true or true, or I don't know. It's alleged. But she mentioned that she understood the purpose of religion after experiencing the death of her dad. That's what it was. Okay. So, because at that point in time, it's kind of like, okay, you start to wonder where does the body go? What happens to this person? You're trying to seek comfort, all these things. So now Charlotte, you know, like I said, she made that comment earlier about like, hey, do you think that with Big Bean in heaven, do you think that he would never want you to see anybody or kiss anyone or experience love again or something along those lines? All right, we're going to move on. This was one of the things I do remember when I um, watched the real episode <laughs> when Big's brother, John, comes in. He's like, where's John? And that joke where Carrie was like, he's dead. <laughs> I actually thought that the joke landed. Okay. You know, because basically not to say that I'm laughing at dementia, but, you know, I, I don't know. This shiggity was funny to me. It was just all the way kinds of funny. <laughs> she was like, he's dead. Um, but anyway, I think when the writers wrote this or whoever wrote this, like, see, it wasn't like all this shock and awe, right? Unlike when Samantha Irby's on there, she wants to do some crazy. It, the, the joke landed. I get it. They basically wanted to, it, what it did was it made Carrie in this moment start to think about what are you going to do with his ashes? What, come on, like, what, what's the plan? Okay. So, um, and then they, they called out the point where he was like, you could be here, you could be here. And if I remember correctly, when I was watching that episode, I was cracking up at the same stuff where they were like, hey, you can be buried next to, you know, whatever, you know, and it's kind of like, what? <laughs> So anyway, I just thought that part was funny. So when the writers wrote all this part here for this last episode, I was like, I can dig it. They called into the point Carrie's disappointment about the whole lamp thing, right? Because when she went to take the lamp that kept cutting on and off, um, she was hoping that like she was searching. She was searching for like, is this communication from Big? Because really what it was was she wasn't quite ready to let him go. So she was looking for answers. And so when she takes that lamp in and then she finds out that when the lamp um, was, I guess they did some sort of diagnostics on the lamp. They found out that there was a loose wire. So I know she was probably disappointed because it's kind of like, was that him talking to me? So basically she's searching with like this connection because grief is real. It's all the way real. Oh, somebody left me a comment. I wasn't paying attention. Did Big's brother attend the funeral? You know what? I don't remember if he attended the funeral. I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I really don't remember, to be honest. Um, but what I will say was when they were writing this portion, I just felt like they didn't do too much. They just kind of kept me take this other banner off. So I'm not like annoying. I felt like this portion in the series and in the episode, I don't think Samantha Irby was one of the writers, but in this moment, I think they toned it down and it made it like a regular thing that it makes you think. But Michael Patrick King is still doing too much because he just, he is really, <sighs> he probably thinks that like, you know, like how in our, our universe or whatever, and we have all the planets that revolve around the sun, he thinks he's the sun. He thinks he's the only universe out here. <laughs> He's too much. I'm telling you, somebody tell him he needs to go get a contract with Audible so he can just talk as much as he wants. 
All right. Now we're going to move on. This is probably where I'm just going to piss people off anyway, since I just like pissing people off. Let me go ahead and take this comment off. If you want to come up, just let me know. I should probably post this. I know people are probably scared to come up. I'll invite people up anyway. I never really dropped this, but I should. Um, let me see. Did I drop that? There it is. Wait. Okay. So the, look, we're going to talk about the rabbi. Where did I write? Rabbi? Uh, rabbi Jen, the, the, the trans rabbi. So look, I never really cared for the um, trans rabbi because I felt like we were more focused on the transness and everybody knows how I feel about the whole transness, right? I just kind of feel like, look, I don't care if you're trans per se, but I don't feel like you should have to be in all the women's spaces, right? Because everyone's going to try to tell me that a woman, a, a trans woman is the same as a cis woman. No, it's not. It's, it's just flat out not. And I don't care how many alterations you get done and how many, um, I don't care how many pills you want to gobble down like Tic Tacs or shoot yourself up with or whatever it is. Okay. So we can still coexist and crack jokes and have a good time. But if you're asking me on a fundamental level, if I think that like we're like fundamentally the same, we are the same as humans. We are human beings. But no, men and women are completely different. Um let me see. Let me put this up there. Either way, it was poor writing. If he attended, the question is poorly asked. If he didn't care, he was wrong, not inviting him. Yeah, so I, I'm going to be honest. I cannot remember if he attended the funeral. I think the writing overall for the series was lazy to be, you know, if I'm going to, I hate to repeat myself, but I thought the writing overall was lazy, but I actually liked that one little quip when they're like, where's John? I don't know why it was funny to me, but I hear it just saying. <laughs> It was funny to me. I'm sorry. It was all the way funny. I'm like, where's John? And she was like, he's dead. <laughs> but you know, look, I'm all the way silly in my mind. Let me get back on track because I am sitting here sidetracking myself. Um, getting back to the Rabbi Jen. Not that Rabbi Jen wasn't like, um, you know, a smart person, whatever. I just kind of felt like I was way too hyper-focused on the fact that the rabbi was trans. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I, I just, it was weird. And the, the deep voice and everything else, it was just so weird anyway. But anyway, what I do like was the rabbi did call out that Rose Now Rock was basically a brat, didn't know um, her, whatever it was that she was supposed to learn for this upcoming um, ceremony. So um, Charlotte rebrands the bar mitzvah to a they mitzvah. Um, she thought that the rabbi was great. Um, who did I say that? No, I said they thought the rabbi was great. So I disagree. I didn't really care for the rabbi. I think primarily because we were way too focused on like the transness of the rabbi, or maybe I was, but also during the, the regular episode, I think what irked me was, and maybe it's just me, if when they were having that bathroom scene and she comes out and she's just like yip yapping about stuff that she doesn't know, I'm like, don't jump in the middle of people's because see, if it had happened to me. I would have gotten the, the rabbi all the way together. I'm like, I don't care what cloth you're cut from. Let me make this clear. You need to go get some business of your own and get out of my business because I don't invite you into my business. <laughs> That's me. The issue was me, I guess. I'm like, I don't care. Mind your business. Your job is to go out there and, and do whatever it is that they do at a bat mitzvah or a day mitzvah, okay? Not be in my business. That's what I would have been like. I'm like, so you can go ahead and see yourself out of this conversation. <laughs> I think they want to make it funny again. Poor taste overall. Are you, are you talking about the actual joke they made about where is John or just in general? I think I'm probably the only one who probably thought that part was funny. <laughs> Look, I am a little bit of a ding dong myself. There's things I find funny that nobody finds funny. But yeah, the writers, they're, they're problematic in themselves. So, all right. Um, they were, t they were talking about how great Rab Rabbi Jen was. Um, I don't know. I just was like, hmm. I don't know. The only thing I liked was the fact that they called out that brat behavior of Rose Now Rock. So they called out the whole hot fella storyline and the fact that, um, Anthony was supposed to make like Sarah Do Hollow that they said, don't do it. I don't know why they felt to put that in there. I just, it, it was lost on me. Cause I mean, I know that Hollow wasn't made out of Sarah Do, but I don't know why there was so much interest in that. And maybe someone could enlighten me on that. Um, but I do like the fact that they use Anthony to call out, um, basically how spoiled, 
Rose now rock was. And he was like, you go in here and get yourself together, get it together, sister. Like he was like fussing at the daughter because I felt like, you know, Charlotte wanted to just be too nice. Like, I'm just going to like tell her like, well, this is what we're doing. This is the thing. Like, these are certain rules we have, right? Not to say that you can't ask for feedback and stuff like that, because I do talk with my kids. But at the end of the day, I'm like, look, you know, within reason, I will listen. But at the end of the day, I'm like, um, you're not the parent. And when you get your own place, you can make all the rules and decisions you want, you know? But anyway, so basically, um, both of the original female writers, which is, uh, I always have to write their names down, Liza Zariski and Julie Rottenberg, um, they threw, they were talking about how they just came through uh, recently thrown about mitzvah for their daughters. And so I felt like if they just mentioned that they threw about mitzvah for their daughters, this was the perfect opportunity for Michael Patrick King to shut up. Just all the way shut up. Just shut up. So anyway. So Michael Patrick King thought that this was going to be like a really great scene. So I'm sorry, I'm reading my notes here. So Miranda. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. We fast forward to, this was my favorite scene was when <laughs> Beanie Cat Satan shows up <laughs> to the club <laughs> with Shay. <laughs> and I was cracking up because if I remember correctly, I'm like, wait a second. She looked like another old lady next to the old ladies. And so they, I'm going to read my notes here. So Michael Patrick thing thought this was going to be a great scene. Miranda is wearing pink, this pink, ugly dress. She was supposed to come meet the family. So she's thinking she's meeting the family, but she's coming to basically like a, I don't know what that was that Shay threw. So she's sitting next to the gray haired ladies and she thought it was going to be a dinner or something. Shay starts singing about going to Cali and Miranda's like, what? Because <laughs> she doesn't know how to read the room now. And so... I read that the writers wrestled with Beanie Cap Satan going to Cali. They weren't sure if wanting Shay to struggle. Oh, they weren't sure if they wanted Shay to struggle with her faithfulness towards Miranda. Um, I don't know. They they talk about how they Shay is like, hey, but I want you to come to California. They just didn't know if they wanted her to be faithful or unfaithful. Um, they got Miranda. So they they called out something that I actually forgot, which was they said that. In this scene, I think that there's a scene about people like downing these shots, like taking a couple of shots before <laughs> Shay starts singing. And they're like, remember, Miranda almost has a drinking problem. So they were like, uh, but then they were talking about some other stuff. So basically what we were supposed to get out of it was Miranda has to make a decision to choose herself. So they were like, this wasn't about Miranda, Beanie Cap Satan, leaving Steve. Um, she's leaving because it wasn't working. They're like, they're saying that she didn't leave because she wanted to be with Shay. They're saying she left because it wasn't working. And this is the thing. Let me just pause right here. I think what, I, well, let me just speak for myself. What would have gone over better with her leaving Steve was if they had finessed the storyline. I mean, I know I've said it multiple times. They didn't finesse the storyline. So either you need to have more episodes or longer episodes. But what they did was they rushed right on through it. They just rushed through it, and then Miranda was a lesbian. Had they given us some more or finessed that storyline, this would have been a little bit more palatable. But what happened was they just, there it is. We're going to give you everything at once. Rose now rock, a uh, lesbian, leaving Steve, death, everything, everything. Just, just like, it was just like every possible moment. Like, Charlotte mistaken the all the black people for the same black people. <laughs> I was like, we're going to get it all. So I think that's the reason why people were just kind of like, it was like lazy writing. It was like, they sped up the storyline. It was lazy, all the way lazy. I could have written, I could have been one of the writers. And then what would have happened was during all of this, people who typically like are, experiencing or if they're writing to something that's happened in their lives, I would let them run that episode all the way run it. Michael Patrick King, what he should have done was introduced people and then wrapped it up. That's it. But instead he centered himself. Now, Michael Patrick King said that we are dragging our societal paradigms into everything. 
He said, that's what's brought. That's basically in a nutshell. Hold on. Hold on. Let me, let me go ahead because I don't remember the exact verb, verbiage. He's basically said that <laughs> we are all basically bringing in our societal paradigms into, I guess, like all of this that's going on. And I'm like, no, the way they wrote Miranda, they wrote her looking like beanie cap Satan. Okay. It's not us just bringing it into all of our societal paradigms because the fact of the matter is like, that's just not like everyone doesn't operate that way. Paradigm or not. Like it's just, we just don't, it didn't make sense. And basically the writers are too busy licking themselves like they're cats. They're constantly preening because they're so in love with themselves and they, the shiggity didn't even make any sense. So it was like the self looking ice cream cone. They were totally serving themselves. Okay. They did not care about the viewer, right? In their mind, they knew where the stories were going, but they accelerated everything so fast. I was like, well, what just happened? Uh, this is a day. Can't say girlfriend because she's also a thing. So Rose now rock. They, uh, Tampon gate, lamp gate, everything gate, uh, bean cap Satan bringing cookies. He's wearing practically a doily or old lady dress to the club. I'm like, since when did Miranda start wearing old lady dresses to clubs? But gray hair sitting between two gray hair ladies. I'm never going to get over that one. I mean, the whole thing made no sense. Steve is stupid. He's like, ah, 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 ah. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's always yelling. I'm like, Samantha's suddenly gone. They made her cold. I'm like, Samantha was never like that. The whole thing was crazy. Charlotte is stuck in a time warp with like some 1950s dresses and doing that weird eye thing she does in the head, like the weird thing that she does. He got beanie cap Satan just showing us all her teeth all the time. She really needs to be called 32. Oh, wait, did I just spin on my computer? 32. She's like, I'm like, it was like crazy. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what's going on. What is going on? Now, they think the problem is us as the viewer. And I'm like, no, we are not the problem. You're the problem. To, uh, to meditate. She said, what is it? I assume you're talking about the uh, the call-in one. I can put, put, there's the link if you want to call in. So then um, the way I look at it was, um, I think he, he just was just too busy thinking about himself. Like I said, he needs to go get a contract with Audible. Go get a contract with Audible. He loves to talk on these kind of pl platforms. He's got the voice for it. Go ahead and contact Audible. He would be a great book narrator. Now, let's move on. So they wanted Miranda to make a decision about her hair. Something, I'm like, I didn't catch that, right? I think she just showed up with her hair. Now, they basically alluded to that. They said that it was during that scene when she was sitting between the two gray-haired ladies and Shay wanting to go to California, singing about going to California. So almost as if like that, that decision was made there. I think that's what they were trying to say. I don't know. They didn't use those words. Hold on a second. Everything is alleged. Alleged, alleged, alleged. Oh, okay. So um, I'm just kind of like, wow, well, they were basically saying that I will say this. Okay, this was interesting. They said that Miranda, they called out Miranda's hypocrisy because in the beginning she was on a soapbox about, you know, the whole hair thing in the beginning. You're like, oh, me being Grace challenging you. That whole conversation she had with Charlotte, uh, I can't remember what episode it was. Maybe it was the first one about dyeing the hair situation. So she went through this whole thing about why she was going to be gray. And then she just happened to change her hair back to red. Um, I guess towards the end, I'm almost done with this because... I really was done with this whole writer's podcast thing. So they're talking about like, yeah, so Miranda's making all these changes. She's evolving. She threw away her internship. And um, they called out this whole implicit feeling of a contract between friends, which I thought was interesting. With During the whole rabbi scene, when she comes out of the bathroom, minding everybody's business but her own, basically like when Miranda and Carrie were talking, instead of should I read my notes or should I just go off the top of my head? They're basically saying, how do I say this? You've got Miranda feeling as if like people are judging her. Okay. Like, don't judge me for wanting to make all these changes. Like, am I not allowed to change? And they're basically saying, Carrie's like, I'm not really judging you. You are allowed to change. 
right? I think she was just kind of like, whoa, wait a second, you know, just trying to like, and I think what they were saying is, I think there's this implicit contract between friends as far as like who you are in these relationships. And Miranda, I think she had these, these feelings on her own as far as like, people just want me to be the same. I think people just didn't understand because everything happened fast. The way they wrote this storyline was it just happened so fast. So how can you possibly expect anyone to understand? All right. So, but anyway, Miranda, I, I remember saying this in my recap, Miranda calls out to say like, you have time to come up with all of this, but you don't have time, like as far as the, the whole song in the, in the club, but you don't have time to tell me like what's going on. And so apparently Shay admitted that she was a narcissist. I don't remember that. I mean, maybe she did during that episode, but I'm glad they called it out that Shay is a narcissist. But anyway, Miranda went in that bathroom scene. I'm sorry, I'm skipping around a little bit because of the way they recapped it. Miranda is basically asking why she can't be this new person. Carrie says, you can't be this person. Miranda's like, well, she's basically feeling like she was being judged when in fact she wasn't. Carrie realizes like, you know what? Like going back to that whole implicit um, expectation and contract between friends, uh, they basically said that Carrie is basically at this point realizing like, you know, what I always expected my friends to be there for me. So instead I need to do this on my own. This is the whole going off to Paris thing, whatever. So um, they called up the fact that when, after Carrie got the lamp fixed, right. And when she gets back home, the lamp did the weird thing again, the flashing. So, and they were basically calling out the, the couple of flashbacks that she had the, a big at Jackie's wedding. And then again, in this flash dream. So that was her impetus to go to, um, I'm sorry, go to Paris in her big orange dress, which I kind of liked because it was just like so ridiculous and fabulous at the same time. So I didn't have a problem with that. I'm like, you do you carry. <laughs> so let me go back to rock now, Rose now rock. So they basically, so they brought up some interesting points. Um, I don't even know how to really approach this. They're basically saying, in an, hold on, let me put this up one more time. Everything is alleged until it's proven to be true or untrue or something along those lines. No, my cat did not just like push my door open. See, let me tell you, they don't respect my boundaries. So Rose now rock, they said, is basically calling out the, the, the younger generations, okay, are having this moment where they're like do we have to decide everything now they don't like all these labels um and basically calling out the fact that the the youth today the way they develop mentally and everything else is so much different than what we were back in the day i think i kind of sort of agree to some sort of extent extent right um hold on one moment i need to mute because my door is open and that thing is loud Sorry about that. My family just really felt like they needed to turn on the television on the side of my wall and turn it up super loud. So anyway, they're saying that, that the youth develop differently. I don't know if the youth are developing faster. I don't know if I agree with that. I think exposure, yes. Development, no. I mean, the, the biology is still the biology, okay? I mean, I'm not talking about puberty coming fast or whatever like that. My cat is really just gangster right now. I really think my cat just threw up some gangsta, gangster signs and just was like, both this door is going to be open. <laughs> so they were talking about the generational difference between um, Miranda asking, do I have to be the same person versus Rose now Rob basically saying, I don't want to be the same person. Come here. This is who is like being real gangster. This one, my diva cat. Stop. Just look. Say hi. All right. She is Chanel number five, also known as Chanel. She's my diva cat. And this is what I would say about that development situation. I think we are equating exposure. Sorry, let me take down this banner. I am so sorry. You could tell I'm, I'm like in a way. I think we are equating exposure with development. 
And those things aren't necessarily the same. They are not mutually inclusive. Okay. I think in general, our biology and physical physicality or whatever, it, it is what it is, right? Like as, as um, age blocks, right? So with that being said, do I think the youth, because of their exposure, they have more information at their fingertips? Are they more aware of issues and stuff? Yes. Does it mean that they are making the best choices and all these other things all the time? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't think that they're smarter per se. I mean, they, they kind of are, but I think they have more exposure and access. They have more touch points. Okay. So with that being said, they're talking about how Rose Now Rock is basically like, I don't want all of these labels is like, but then they started getting down to that whole, even with human names. So they called out Scout Rock, et cetera. Like almost like, I don't even need a human name. And this is where, excuse me, sorry. I say there is, this is where I, I jump in, right? Because even with all that information, our youth having the ability to discern, that's still, you have to have these life experiences and, and there's like a maturity into certain things. So if you're calling into, it's hard for me to explain this, having the information and knowing what to do with it. So, you know, like how we're dealing with all this identity stuff. Like I said, I liken it to postmodernism. I oh, I thought I'd say the graphic of that, right? Where postmodernism really addresses more of the individuality instead of the communal, like the group stuff. It expresses more of the identity versus, right? You have the regular and you have like the postmodernism. So with the youth who are living in this postmodernist world, like every generation goes through, this the youth today are more concerned with individuality, um, identity, and that type of stuff. So if you have a youth, if you have youth who are more concerned with identity, and if you're going down to the point where you don't even want like humanity, you're talking about like scout rock, right? So I question that. And so I know this is not going to be popular, but I question that. Just because you have all this information and just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? And that's where I, I draw the line and I, I think about the ability to discern. And there's just certain things I don't have to feed. But because of nowadays, everybody is conscious or woke, whatever word you want to use, what happens is we seem to think that everything should be up for, I'm like, oh, no, there's just certain things I'm like, no. But when you're old enough and when you're grown and you are fully self-supporting. And when I say fully self-supporting, I mean, you're not living off of me. You can take care of yourself and take care of all your finances, your health and everything. Make those decisions for yourself. Not to say that I can't encourage expression and some individuality, but I think with this postmodernist world we live in, they're very focused on this identity stuff and stuff like that. So anyway, getting back to this, they're basically trying to make this this whole like comparison between Miranda wanting to change and Rose now rock saying I am changing. So I feel like this. I'll say it again. I don't feel like I have to co-sign all behavior just because you can change your name or change your sex or whatever it is doesn't mean you should. I feel like as a youth, there's certain things I'm like I'm not encouraging this. I'm not. You know, that doesn't mean you, if you look, if you want to cut your hair, dye your hair, whatever. But I kind of feel like there's certain things at the core. I'm like, why are you that concerned about that? Why are you so hyper-focused on you being a human or not being a human, being a man, being a woman? Not to say that you can't question puberty, or question puberty, um, uh, sexuality, play, but I just kind of feel like there's way too much hyper-focused attention spent on that. And I'm like, and there's other things we could be focusing on. There's a lot of things we could be focusing on, but we seem to be, there's this agenda out there where it's like, we're so focused on that. Why is that the only thing that seems to be important? So I said what I said. So anyway, they wanted to, they really kind of like leaned in on that and I'm like, okay. So, all right. Then they went into this whole like how 
Kristen Davis, they really love, 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 love her. And she had to learn the, um, I forgot what it's called, but basically there's like a poem or some sort of um, passage that you have to memorize for the, the mitzvah. So anyway, Michael Pastor King loves Charlotte's journey and her arms are basically open wide to love in whatever form. Anyway, I'm almost done. Carrie is, um, let, what did I say? She blinked of her love. Oh, something about testing her love or something. So she's basically getting her groove back with Franklin, the, the podcast guy who was like, who wants to manage her or whatever. Okay, whatever. So she gets a groove back with him. Um, this is the thing that cracks me up. I'm like, apparently, remember in, when I was recapping these episodes, I kept saying the writers are trolling us, right? This is what Michael Patrick King, the ding dong himself says. Basically, he was talking about how they really thought that they were hiding the hot extra guy. Okay, now where were they going? They were talking about the guy that basically in that Carrie sticks her tongue down his throat and he sticks his down her throat. They were like, yeah, we're going to introduce this guy in little bits and pieces as if we couldn't see where that was going. And they were like, and almost as if like, they'll never know. Right. And then he's like, eventually people was like, they weren't really fools after a while. You know, like they were like, oh, she's going to end up with him. Oh, of course. It was like he was like standing there looking a certain kind of way, like. Ready. So then I'm like, no one was fooled. They're like, no one was fooled. And then Michael Patrick King, he's like, man, we were leaving all these little breadcrumbs and everyone just kind of knew. And then like they and then Franklin admits to Carrie that he had been watching her, I think, at the wedding or whatever. I'm like. This was no surprise. I told you the writing was so lazy, lazy. Carrie picks up the whole Samantha relationship. Now, this is what they said. When she's over in Paris, she's wearing the orange dress and she dumps out the, the, the ashes or whatever. And when she's reaching out to Samantha and they're basically seeing that she picks up her old friendship, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, it was almost as if like Samantha was letting go of some things too. I'm like, well, first of all, the way they wrote Samantha was horrible because she was never this cold person. Now all of a sudden she's just forgiving Carrie. I'm like, if they, what they should have done was had a Samantha person maybe sitting in the back of the actual funeral or something, someone maybe a lookalike, maybe with her hat down or something as if paying her respects. It didn't make sense that they didn't have Samantha if she's alive at the funeral for Carrie. And this is why I say the writing was lazy. That made no sense. That is not even the core of who Samantha Jones was. So now basically they're like all for a woman to end the season with open hearts. Um, then it ends. And then they were like, Oh, at the end, and that really isn't the end because now Carrie is alone in the podcast booth talking about love, which is called our name sex in the city. And I'm done with it. So anyway, now you know why I had such a hard time getting this last one out. Cause when I was listening to Michael Patrick King, thinking that he was not narrating like an audible book, I was just like about like woman stuff. <laughs> This is like all the way miss me. He just needs somebody tell him he needs to get on Audible. Um, yeah, I'll even write a book. I'll write a book. He can narrate my book. It'll be called Why Men Should Stay Out of Women's Business. How about that? Right? Um, that's where I'm at with it. Anyway, so look, let me get off of here. If anybody wants to come up here, let me know. Put it in the chat. You don't have to come up. Um I would show you what it looks like outside. It has the audacity to be snowing. Here it is March. I think Monday starts spring. I'm like, it is full on snow out here. We had to cancel all the sporting stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. All right. I'm done with recapping this right now. It took me forever to get this last one out. But anyway, look, if you guys want me to talk about something else, put it in chat. Let me know. Just go ahead and message me. I'll talk about some other things. But I am glad to be done with um, and just like that, at least this first uh, season of that. Uh, my takeaways overall, you know, I had some written down. And I threw that sticky out. Overall, this is what I think. Michael Patrick, Michael Patrick King is Google. He needs to be narrating all audible books. Um, they need to um, make a change with Charlotte. They need to update Charlotte so that she's not too much of a dingbat. Take her out of those stupid dresses because that's not even realistic. Um, Beanie Cap Satan needs to tone it down. And um, Sima could do no wrong. and She's perfect in every way. And I would even say the same thing for LTW because after she showed up in that outfit coming out of the limo, I was like, 
Yes. I, I don't know what that was. That was hilarious. It was so toned up, but it was so perfect for that character. I was all the way. Yes. Um, I do want to see more Anthony and um, I don't know. They need to finesse the storyline. I'm sure they're going to get a season two. I'm not sure, but I'm sure they need to finesse the storylines. I think that, yeah, they did it a disservice. Take their time. Like I said, give us more episodes or make the episodes longer. All right. And they need to figure out what they're going to do with the Samantha Jones character. I know that Kristen, I can never get her name, Control. Um, I know she doesn't want to come back. But they need to find a, a, a better way of having her exit the series in a meaningful way that is not disrespectful to the character or find a way to convince her to come back. And Sarah Jessica Parker can just gonna have to get out of her feelings and get over herself because the fact of the matter is if Kristen, Kristen Control, whatever her name is, if she comes back, she knows that everyone's going to be like, Kristen Control, or at least I was. All right, that's it. They need, oh, they need to stop doing Steve the way they did it. They need to allow him to exit with a level of dignity because like they turned him into a, from a sexual person to a 100 year old man. Who was like, hey, hey, how's it going? Always yelling and carrying on, doing some weird stuff. I'm like, fix the volume on that shiggity. You pay for it. It needs to be in your ear and you need to get yourself together. Um, also, I would say that the Writer's Room podcast needs to have people call in and I need to be the first one. And I will take it down a couple notches. I won't get them too bad. I definitely want to have words with Samantha Irby. She was doing too much. I don't know why she was so weird, but she was all the way weird. And... um. That's it. Yeah, I'm done with it. All right. So look, I, I assume you guys didn't want to come up. That's fine. <sighs> Black, opinionated woman. 